And it's been the largest change on the planet, perhaps, with half of the Arctic sea ice now gone. A place like Florida would be underwater. It's a rewriting of the global coastline. We are not passengers on the Earth, we are crewmates. Hi, I'm Amanda Bloom, and welcome to Hanging On by a Thread. The Doomsday Glacier is officially hanging on by its fingernails. And once it slips, there's nothing we can do to stop the catastrophic effects. Officially the Thwaites Glacier, the Doomsday Glacier is located in West Antarctica and is currently eroding at its underwater base. If the Florida-sized glacier retreats past its seabed ridge, scientists say it will signal an end to human ability to prevent mass climate change, raising sea levels by up to 16 feet. But how do we even reach this possible irreversible end? For nearly five decades, Congress has refused to act on rising carbon levels. We adopted well over a dozen major pollution control statutes between 1970 and 1990, but we've only adopted one since then, which was an amendment. The great question is why? What's happened? That's Michael Vandenberg, former EPA chief of staff and a professor at Vanderbilt who specializes in environmental governance. I sat down with him to discuss the exact reason for the United States' lack of action. Vandenberg points to two major flaws in the United States that explain recent legislative failures. Since 1990, when the conveyor belt of new legislation stopped, what you see is a remarkable growth in the polarization between Republicans and Democrats on environmental issues. And when I was the EPA chief of staff in the mid-90s, we worked closely with people who were both Democrats and Republicans. But that's a very unusual thing now. We are sorting ourselves into different groups in a way that we never did before. When I was a child, it wasn't unusual at all for a Republican to be a liberal and for a Democrat to be a conservative. It wasn't unusual for people to live next to each other as a conservative or liberal. And that's all changed now. We are sorting ourselves into very different populations. With the recent rise of political polarization, it seems as though climate change has become a target. The polarization we see on climate change is not deeply different from the polarization we see across many different issues. And so just recently, climate was listed as number one among the most polarized issues. Many in the United States do not believe in climate change, despite all the science backing it up. And Michael Vandenberg understands why. Climate change itself was not a deeply polarized issue until about 2008. So John McCain, who was the Republican candidate for president in 2008, was the co-sponsor of a major climate change bill. And people don't realize that today. It was after 2008 that the thought leaders in the media and in the political parties began aligning climate change with being a liberal or a Democrat rather than a Republican. What's interesting is that even with that alignment today, more than half of all Republicans think we should be doing more about climate change. They just have what's called pluralistic ignorance. That is, they think that most other Republicans don't think we should do something about it. Since the Senate only has 100 members, they don't have regulations on speaking time. This opens the door for the filibuster, which is when a senator talks for a prolonged period of time to prevent voting on a bill. Because the filibuster rule in the Senate requires 60 votes to overcome a filibuster for anything but a budget bill, all we're getting now are are finance or budget-related bills. So we don't have the ability right now to adopt new pollution control statutes. And that's, that's where we stand. We can do a fair amount with subsidies, but we probably can't get that close to where we need to be. Not even bipartisan legislation could have passed such a polarized Senate. Professor Vandenberg and I discussed powerful legislation that, if passed, would have significantly changed America's relationship with the environment. One bill in particular, co-sponsored by a Republican legislator, could have completely changed how well, carbon emissions look in the United States. I wish that the McCain-Lieberman bill had, had passed, and, and that was a major cap-and-trade bill that, again, was co-sponsored by Um, Republican John McCain, and then Democrat Joe Lieberman. And that bill had about an 80 percent emissions reduction requirement for the United States and would have allowed capping and trading of pollutants to keep the cost down. And that came reasonably close to passing in the 2000s. And then the United States would be in a much better place today. We'd be more competitive globally. We would be passing less of a burden onto your generation. Um, in terms of both the climate harms that will occur and the emissions reductions you're going to need to make. And we would be in a place where our industries would be better positioned 
to provide the kind of goods and services we want without creating this burden on hundreds of future generations. So these two issues of the Senate and political polarization have a deep correlation. We're living in closed information ecosystems today, and those closed information ecosystems then have an interplay with the primary system so that you have to appeal to your base in the electoral process in order to um, to get out of the primary and run in the general election. Also, our constitutional design was set up to favor small rural states. So today, 18 percent of the U.S. population controls 50 votes, 52 votes in the U.S. Senate. And that means that if you don't appeal to those uh, those small population, more rural states, you can't actually get governance done on important issues like climate change. So that leaves us with two questions. Where would lawmakers even begin to heal the planet? And is any of it feasible in our current political climate? 